put their name and title in the chat. Great. Give everybody just a minute to log in. Can we encourage people to come off video? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Thank you to everyone for joining us today for DSF's Listen and Learn seminar series. Um, we'd really like to start off by thanking our educational sponsors who made this series possible, including Greenwich Biosciences, Norellis, Zogenics, Encoded Therapeutics, and Stoke Therapeutics. We would also like to thank the American Epilepsy Society for their partnership with DSF to provide CME accreditation for this series. We'll be sending emails following the session today with instructions for claiming credit. Lastly, registrants should have received a link to a survey to assess the baseline knowledge of Dravet syndrome among professionals prior to accessing the webinar series. And we'd just like to ask you to please keep an eye out for a follow-up survey after the live series completes on November 16th and consider taking a moment to fill this out even if you were unable to complete the pre-series survey. Um, today, you know, we'd love to encourage you um, to turn your video on and be an active participant in the webinar today. Um, feel free at any time to drop questions or comments into the chat, or you can hold questions um, or discussion topics to the end to ask Joe and Ashley yourself. Um, lastly, another thing we would like to add per to ask participants to do today is to just drop your um, credentials or why you're here at this uh, seminar series, what your relationship to Gervais syndrome is um, into the chat box. Um, with that, I'll introduce our two speakers today. Um, first, we have Dr. Joe Sullivan. He's an associate professor of neurology and pediatrics um, and the director of the UCSF Pediatric Epilepsy Center. Dr. Sullivan received his medical degree from Albany School of Medicine and completed residencies in pediatrics at Children's Memorial Hospital at Northwestern University. He also completed child neurology, clinical neurophysiology, and epilepsy training at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. As a clinician, Dr. Sullivan sees patients in both the outpatient and inpatient setting and has specific interests in epilepsy surgery as well as the genetic epilepsies. Ashley Wood is a licensed clinical social worker providing psychotherapy to individuals and families in private practice in Northern California. She has an undergraduate degree in human development and family studies from the University of Vermont and a master of science and social work from Columbia University. Her experience as a parent of a child with Dravet syndrome led her to co-write a product for families living with epilepsy called the Life Support Project. We are so thrilled to have um, Dr. Sullivan and Ashley Wood here today to talk to us about Dravet syndrome and how to support the whole family through a diagnosis. Thank you, Ashley and uh, Dr. Sullivan. I'll turn it over to you now. Great, thank you, Veronica. And thank you for our, uh, to everyone for joining us today. I think this is the last of the series of the Listen and Learn. So hopefully you've been, uh, oh, there's one more, okay. Um, but hopefully you've been able to, to uh, dial in to a couple of the others. Um, this is actually gonna be, I think a little bit of a different uh, type of, of presentation. Uh, I'm honored to have uh, Ashley join me uh, on this because I have learned uh, a lot from her because I care for her daughter Piper, as you can see here at the bottom of the slide. And in our journey together, as we've, we've um, gone through uh, following uh, not only Piper, but our other families that are affected with Dravet syndrome from a diagnosis uh, to young adulthood, uh, I think we're gonna hopefully show you that this really does take a team approach 
uh, and hopefully we'll, you'll take home some some practical tips, um, both um, as a provider or even if you as a caregiver is calling in uh, of how to to navigate this this challenging diagnosis. So here are uh, my disclosures, which are mostly related to contracted research and various uh, epilepsy studies. And I also do sit on the Drug Aid Syndrome Foundation um, Board and Medical Advisory Board. Here are Ashley's uh, disclosures. And again, I think the relevant ones are uh, her husband, Tim, uh, is also a board member of the Drug Aid Syndrome Foundation, and that she has created this life support uh, project uh, by the lab method and is a 50% owner uh, in, those, uh, uh, in those card decks, which we're gonna highlight in this presentation. So um, in this sort of 30 minutes, we basically have two learning objectives that we hope to, to cover. First is to um, recognize the evolution of both seizure and non-seizure related comorbidities in a patient and family living with Dravet syndrome. And I think, you know, for the purposes of this talk, we're really gonna focus on more of the non-seizure related comorbidities. Uh, some of my other colleagues as part of the series have gone over uh, more of the clinical day-to-day, -day, you know, month-to-month -month details of the seizure related comorbidities. And so we're not gonna really go into too much detail. And really what I hope that I, uh, we can focus on here is, uh, is how to apply and integrate family focused care um, beyond just seizure ma management into all of our clinical visits. We know that, that this is so critically important. We know this takes a lot of time, um, but I think what you'll hear from, from Ashley, not only as a, as a licensed clinical therapist, um, but also as a parent, um, that families want to hear this from us. Uh, and a lot of us maybe don't feel super comfortable um, engaging in these conversations. But I think once we do, uh, everybody really does benefit. So a Dravet diagnosis. Um, again, this is hopefully review for many of you that are calling in, um, but it's pretty, pretty widely accepted um, that uh, majority of these kids have their first seizures by the first year uh, of life. They are often prolonged, and we define prolonged as, as greater than 10 minutes. This is not by any means everyone. Some, some children can present with their initial seizures that may, may be three or four minutes, um, but more often than not, they are longer than 10 minutes, and even, even more specifically, they can be 30, 45 minutes in duration. Also, by definition, these children are normal prior to their first seizure. And this is where I'm hopefully going to show you we've come a really long way in terms of when to suspect this diagnosis, because I think, I know when I was in training, you know, to think of, of, of a syndrome such as Dravet syndrome um, and this, this child that comes in with, with uh, no epilepsy risk factors, and then you start thinking, how could this person, how could this child have a genetic epilepsy? Uh, it really wasn't on a lot of our radar screens, but now I think we have a, a much better understanding and this is allowing us as clinicians to suspect this diagnosis earlier and earlier, and then we can start this journey that will hopefully lead to, to better um, patient outcomes. In the following months, uh, other seizure types do occur, and that's really what should set off the, the, the bells and whistles for us as to, as to when to suspect uh, a Dravet syndrome diagnosis. And I just throw this other bullet in here about vaccines, because vaccines is a very contentious um, uh, subject, um, especially now in the setting of a pandemic. Um, uh, vaccines and, and what role they play um, in the presentation of a child with Dravet syndrome. And this has actually been looked at in a few studies where um, it's been shown that yes, those patients that do uh, seem to have their first presenting seizures associated with a vaccine um, do tend to present a little bit earlier. But when you look at them over time, um, there really is no difference uh, in their outcomes. So we as providers really recommend a normal um, vaccine schedule um, for for all of our all of our Dravet patients. So I already um, uh, sort of um, foreshadowed this. So diagnosis, um, we are um, getting better. This is uh, a summary of a study um, that was just published a few years ago um, from a European study of, of uh, over 500 patients uh, with Dravet syndrome. And they looked at um, when those patients, how old they were currently and when the diagnosis was first suspected. And so you can see that those that have a diagnosis, and this also may also be a little bit of a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy here, that those that are two years of age and actually have a current diagnosis of, of, of um, Dravet, uh, almost 90% of them were, were diagnosed less than 12 months after their first seizure. 
Uh, in fact, a third of them were diagnosed six months after their procedure. And this is what we're really trying as a field to, to, to move forward, that to suspect that, that early, early diagnosis. But then if you look at those adults that currently live with a Dreve syndrome diagnosis, only 12% of them actually were immediately recognized. So you think of how far we've come, if you define an adult as 18 and older, you think back 15 years, 16 years, um, the majority of these, of these now adults um, had a delay, uh, a delay in their diagnosis. And then somewhere in the middle, um, those school-aged children, so those that are currently six to 11 years of age, um, we're, we're better, but still um, not less, still less than half of those, those kids um, had a diagnosis um, uh, in three years after this uh, first seizure. And I think we would all hopefully agree that we, we need to avoid falling into that, that diagnostic delay. Um, so this is a, a figure um, that was uh, taken um, from this article. And I think um, it's a really busy figure and I'm certainly not gonna go through uh, all of it here. Um, but it really uh, breaks down the uh, evolution of Dravet syndrome into three stages uh, over time here on the x-axis. Mm -hmm. um, and it really tries to also look at not only seizures, but non-seizure related uh, issues. And so you can see this is a roller coaster ride for these patients and therefore their families. You have to the left here, um, a higher incidence of status epilepticus, which is highlighted in the SE. Uh, then you can actually see the, the gray or the black dotted line is the developmental disability, which increases over time. And then you can see in stage three, uh, some of the other um, issues such as uh, motor disorders of ataxia and crouch gait start to become uh, more problematic. And I think we as clinicians really need to have this picture in our mind when we're making um, a new diagnosis of Dravet, because I think as we'll hear from Ashley, families want to hear about this journey that they um, are uh, very likely going to, to, to be on. So I first wanna break this down into the first visit, given the diagnosis. And again, this is, this is changing a lot. This is changing um, year by year. I can tell you that I have not made a first diagnosis with Dravet syndrome, uh, uh, an initial diagnosis of Dravet syndrome in probably about 18 months. Um, so most patients now are coming to me um, with a diagnosis in hand, um, which is fantastic, right? It's, it's, I, I was often, um, it was very frustrating often when we would, when I would see a second opinion um, for intractable seizures at three or four years of age. And it was I that was making that diagnosis of Dravet syndrome um, at that point in time. So thankfully that's not happening um, uh, as often. Um, but I think um, even when a patient is coming to me as a second opinion and may already have that diagnosis in hand, maybe they're coming from a general child neurologist, it's, it's highly likely that they, are, they haven't gotten into some of these, these, these nuances of, of what to expect. And in a lot of ways is why they maybe get referred to an epilepsy center or maybe why a parent seeks out that type of referral. And so one thing that I've learned from Ashley is, is as we go into these difficult uh, um, first interactions is that we really do need to take a deep breath, try to regulate ourselves. It's going to be a difficult conversation but, but we're all in this to try and improve the lives of these patients and their families. And so the more that you can go into it and, and, and show that empathy, I think goes a really, really long way. Um, I think it really is important uh, um, also, some families may come for a second opinion because there's still a lot of doubt and they're hoping that the referring docs got it wrong and, and, and want you know, someone who sees a lot of patients with Dravet syndrome to say, no, in fact, I disagree. Um, so I think it's important, certainly if you do agree, to walk through those steps as to, to why, um, why this is a diagnosis of, of Dravet syndrome. Uh, I, I suspect that in 2020, the majority of these children do have genetic testing um, in hand, and there's a lot of, um, a, uh, still a lot of um, um, miscommunication, I think, in terms of how some of these reports are actually done. Uh, and so I think it's important um, to, to incorporate that in layman's terms, right? What are these pathogenic? What does variant of uncertain significance mean? And how that relates to what we still strongly believe is a clinical diagnosis of Dravet, right? Um, you can still have patients that do that have normal genetic testing uh, and that does not exclude um, a Dravet diagnosis. And I think it's really helpful to, to, to walk through that. And in particular, um, the whole notion of Dravet versus GEFS plus. Right. With the availability of the internet, families are certainly online and searching SC1A mutations, and they may come across 
two big different um, um, web pages, right? One is the the unfortunate catastrophic epilepsy, catastrophic epilepsy, and then there's the other, that's this GEFS Plus, and certainly you want to hold out that maybe um, it's going to be in one of the more milder forms. Um, and the genetics doesn't always predict that. So um, uh, there are certainly certain types of mutations that may make that more likely than not, but it really does get back to, again, reviewing that initial clinical presentation. And then I think, you know, setting, setting um, up the, the um, conveying these different uh, community supports. Right now, there's a value not only in having this diagnosis so that we as providers can approach them down the diagnostic pathway, but because of, of, of organizations like the Gervais Syndrome Foundation, there's this can be this really, really strong sense uh, of community. I think it's important in that first visit, once you go through the, the initial diagnosis, to really try to set reasonable expectations up front. Um, you know, in, in, as an epilepsy provider, we, our goal is, in the big picture is no seizures and no side effects. Unfortunately, even in 2020, um, seizure freedom is still a really, really high bar. And I think it's, it's in the patient and the family's best interest just to be upfront about that uh, in the beginning. And to say that seizure freedom for three months is maybe a, a, a reasonable bar, but even that, as you can see, this came from that same European survey, is relatively uncommon. Although I do think that some of our new treatments are starting to move the needle needle on that. Uh, I think it's also important to acknowledge that intellectual disability uh, is common, and this has been looked at uh, in a lot of different studies. Uh, and I think we are seeing a slight shift. Uh, in the, the, the severity of intellectual disability over time. And I think that really is related to earlier diagnosis, more precision-based therapies. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, 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 later on. Um, and again, if seizure freedom is not the, the, the goal, then what is our goal? Our goal is to, to minimize seizure frequency, in particular, to minimize um, the incidence of prolonged seizures, right? And that's gonna get into uh, um, effective rescue medication plans, the anxiety that goes around that. Um, and it's important to, to say that we're not going to make a medication adjustment after every single seizure, right? We kind of need to understand if a seizure is happening a couple times a week, a couple times a month, how consistent is that? Because in, in internal to that roller coaster is a roller coaster on each line, right? So even though there may be seizures that are peaking uh, in, in the second or third year of life, mm -hmm. over the course of a year, there may be still a lot of background variability. And so certainly you don't wanna uh, jump in with a, a changing a medication where maybe that was just a, a, a bad few weeks, um, but to, to make it clear to, to the, the family how you approach that. And there may not be a one size fits all approach to that. Every provider is gonna have a little bit different approach. So again, as I alluded to, to rescue plans, we, we, we definitely want to eliminate um, uh, the, the frequency of prolonged convulsive seizures. And I do think that that's a reasonable treatment goal. We don't want any more episodes of status epilepticus. And I think now with the availability of some of these new FDA approved nasal medications, um, this, the, uh, this can um, um, be a, a realistic, uh, realistic goal. I also think it's important that uh, in the event that the at-home rescue medication doesn't work, it's important for our families to have a, a piece of paper, either that they hand carry or give to their paramedics, or that is on file um, in your, your local emergency room so that they know when this particular child comes in, they don't just go through the standard uh, sort of algorithm that if there's something that has worked for this particular patient or, or, in, or more common not worked, um, that that should be clearly spelled out so that, that we don't go down these, these um, uh, futile pathways. Um, so now I wanna turn it over to, to Ashley. So this is sort of, again, this is after the first visit um, from the provider perspective uh, of what I feel like we should um, cover. And then we're now gonna hear from, from Ashley uh, uh, about some other, uh, other ways um, uh, as a, as a um, caregiver, what they wanna hear and the best ways to do that. So Ashley. So this is a photo of the life support deck of cards for families with epilepsy. And my wish is that more and more um, care centers can have this product available or at least know about it. And it really came out of um, my own experience as a parent combined with my training as a therapist 
to um, one, help families adjust with more ease, but two, in my journey with Joe, I realized that there was so much more to this diagnosis and we were expecting him to help us in all of these areas. And I realized it was just my gift um, and service back to the medical world to just support our families that there's just limited time. Um, and so that's, that's the purpose of this deck of cards that I'm gonna refer to. And as we go, you're gonna see samples of the cards um, throughout the presentation. So next slide. So um, from a parent perspective, the first thing that I just want to encourage or let you all know if you don't already is you're going to be leading us for a while on this journey. When we are with our kids in the beginning and they're seizing and we're just beginning to realize they might have this diagnosis, we are completely terrified and overwhelmed and grief stricken. And so, um, the first area that I think you can play a role is even when we're in the hospital and our kid is there on the table and seizing, I remember times where doctors and nurses would just make room for me to get close to Piper while you're dealing with the medical side of it. And I think it made a world of difference for my nervous system to get a lot of practice at being close to her in a calm and soothing way while the rest of you took care of the medical side. And that was so relieving to me. So if that's not something that you already do naturally, I really encourage you to think that way for the families in the hospital. We feel, we feel more contained with all of you there. So this card is about make it safe and soothing and so you can go through it. Um, the next area, after we're in the hospital and we're beginning to um, be told that we're gonna be discharged, we are thinking, holy shit, how on earth, I'm not trained as a neurologist, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna do this? What things do I need to consider to make our home safe? And so this card is dedicated to that. Every kid and every family is different, but um, if you can lead them just in this conversation, you know, the biggest one in the early days is just having extra video monitors so that you can maybe be somewhere in your house and your kid is safe and you can see the monitor. And if they have a seizure, you can go to them. We just don't know how we're going to navigate this without our kid next to us every second, um, every second of the day. Next, please. Um, Joe alluded to this a little bit, but I can't say enough. In the very beginning, we are um, barely able to retain anything that you say to us. We, um, and this is just due to the, I think, normal emotional overwhelm. And so when you can slow down with us and help us understand the different seizure types that our kid is presenting with, and which seizure types require intervention, rescue, um, as well as the seizure types that don't require anything and we just have to learn how to sit with them and care for our child and keep them safe. But it doesn't mean that we need to do anything um, with medication or rescue. So that rescue protocol, um, I really recommend early on with your Dravet families going through it step by step so that they really, really understand what the heck they're supposed to do. It's so helpful. Next. Um, the next four slides have to do with medication. And um, I really believe a lot in the relationship between our neurologist and the family. And I don't know if this is common knowledge, but the idea that we need to give our kids medicine now twice a day, sometimes multiple medications, it's pretty taxing on us as caregivers and it's really taxing on, um, on the kids. It's repetitive, it's crummy, um, and particularly with kids who can't even swallow pills yet and we've got to figure out how to get eight capsules into some type of thing that they can eat and oh we can't because they're on keto and they can't have sugar 
So as as a provider, if you can just be sensitive and really acknowledge to the parents that this is a dif difficult part of, of the journey. And this card is dedicated, I wish I had it earlier, um, to making it a more playful, light experience. We are so stressed out as parents to get the medicine in because we think that will just keep our kid from having a seizure and we stress our kids out. And so this card is designed to help create a different type of dynamic between kids and parents. Um, the next three cards, and Joe, you can just move through them. They really have to do with, we don't know the questions to ask you until we're in crisis at home in the early days. And so it's inevitable that one of us is gonna miss a, um, a medication dose it's inevitable that our kid is going to get sick and they're not going to be able to keep their medication down. And again, I think in the earlier years, we are so scared of seizures. We just don't want them to come and we feel so responsible. So if you can let your families know in some of those earlier meetings that these situations might come up and these cards can give you ways to navigate them at home, and um, hopefully be less stressed out when it happens. Keep going. One more. Okay, it's back to me. Um, so again, we know that this is a lot to cover uh, in that first, uh, um, uh, that first visit, and that's okay, right? Whether you're establishing a, a relationship, you're hopefully establishing an open line of, of communication. And, and certainly this, this is, uh, I talk about Dravet syndrome, but this this applies to to many of our 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 families and children that are living with with some of the the refractory treatment resistant epilepsies. So I think you know visit two, how however that may how soon that may be. And again, I think this is family dependent. It, someone you may need to see them back in a week or two. Uh, others may need um, may be able to come back in a couple months. But I think it's important to just check in, right? I mean, we're so as a as a epilepsy doctor, right? Everything we're we're not a seizure hammer, uh, and we're not just dealing with just seizures, right? And in fact, that uh, um, we we often spend most of our time talking about the non-seizure related stuff, right? So we need to really check in and, and see see how the family is doing. Assume and that, that mo and that means the world to us. If you just start that second or third, I want to take the pressure off. This can be in the first four visits, but if you just say, "How are you?" This is really hard it's going to actually help us be more present and listen because we feel connected to you. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's exactly, exactly. So again, assume that that first visit was shocking and that there's still a lot of processing going on. And let's say even seizures maybe are going okay, right? Don't, don't make the assumption that sort of um, this can be, this can be a quick visit, right? It's important to check in on all these other things that you may have put in place at that first visit, such as referrals to to your regional um, um, regional centers or, um, for developmental evaluation. Try to get a sense of, of you know, how have just the physical giving of the med of medications been? And what have been the, you know, potential observed uh, side effects uh, of the treatment? What's the family's gut feeling? Do they, do they think it's working, right? I think it's important to, to acknowledge that there may be some skepticism as we're increasing these medications and, he or she is still having seizures. What, like, what are they? What are they doing? And the same holds for the rescue plan, right? Has the rescue plan even been implemented? Have they had a chance? Um, uh, have they had the the chance to actually to give medication? How did that go? Um, did they feel uh, feel comfortable um, um, giving that? And and what was their perception about it being effective? You know, I think that many families want to give the rescue medication immediately, which sometimes may be may be appropriate. Um, but other times I think we can wait a little bit and understand, um, does the seizure need to be given rescue or, or, or does it not? And then this last bullet point here, I think is really key. I mean, it's, um, you know, families are going to be reading a lot because they, they, they want to, they're looking for someone that, that may be like their child and give them some crystal ball and say, well, what did they try? Or what did this child who looks like they're doing really well when they're age 12, what did they do? And I think that's great. You know, we learn a lot from our families. Um, in fact, a lot of the medications that are now approved for Dravet syndrome started with observations in the clinic, right? And so we need to, to listen. 
Um, and we also need to, to uh, respectfully um, um, sort of temper uh, maybe some opinions that may be um, taken um, based on what, what families are reading. But still, keep an open mind and don't dismiss. Don't dismiss uh, some of these things. Um, uh, try to address them in a way um, that, that make, lets the family understand why we're not maybe going down that path for their individual child at that point in time. And again, that roller coaster ride that I showed, right? That was only over an 18 year period. But, but as Ashley can attest, and certainly as my, my inbox can sometimes attest, um, this is a day to day struggle um, um, for families. And, and you know, the, the discussion of, of SUDEP, so sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients, is this has also gotten a lot more attention just in general. Um, over the last few years, because we're hearing from patients and families that they want to hear about this from us and don't want to read about it um, on their own. Um, and so, you know, whether or not this comes up at the first visit, I think a lot of that depends on how that first visit is going, the rapport that you're building with the family, the, the read that you get on what the family is ready to hear at that point in time. But I think we in the, in the epilepsy community and certainly in the Gervais community strongly believe that this does need to come up early in that, that relationship. And, and I'll leave it a little bit open um, as to how early, but, but as Ashley can say, families that they, they live with this fear. It. We find, they find information, it. so we're terrified. So it, if we've found it, then let's talk about it. Exactly. And so there are resources, and again, none of these have actually been proven to necessarily reduce the risk, but um, I think that again, Families are going to find them, and so if they have the means to 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 um, uh, purchase uh, these anti-suffocation pillows, uh, monitors, and things, um, I think it does uh, the majority of the time lead to some uh, um, peace of mind, um, uh, some improved peace of mind uh, on the part uh, of the family. Um, and I, and again, this this interaction with with us as the provider, I, I certainly want to hear um, about um, how things are going. Um, do I need to hear about it every single day? N not necessarily. Um, it's important, though. I'd much rather hear um, weekly updates than to say have someone come back in three months and say, "Yes, Johnny has been seizing every single day." And you're like, "Why didn't you tell me?" And I've been so surprised, um, you know, that how many how much variability there is here. Uh, in terms of, of someone maybe wanting to share um, on a daily basis and others um, not being shared. So just set up, um, say, you know, um, uh, I may not uh, do something every single time you tell me uh, about an interval development, um, but you can at least let me know or let's figure out, do you send me a weekly updates, especially in someone who's in that early diagnosis and you don't know what direction things are going. And then beyond seizures, again, I'd, I'd mentioned that a lot of what we deal with uh, in, in, in some of our visits is talking about the non-seizure related issues. And, and this, this, this first bullet here, getting comfortable with seizures, uh, even at, when I wrote it, um, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost, it, 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 it's a little distasteful in a way, right? Because really you get comfortable with seizures and it's not a comfort, but you just kind of like, okay, this is over time and it's different for every family. They're like, okay, yeah, they got their seizures. Um, they, they have their seizures. Um, but often what happens is over time, there is this sort of acceptance that, okay, I'm, I am more comfortable with being there, being present, regulating myself um, when my child is seizing. And even if you take someone who's having 10 seizures a day, um, which is you know a lot of seizures, uh, understandably, um, the majority of that day, they're still spent not seizing um, and they're spent um, wait, um, recovering from a seizure, um, maybe feeling, uh, maybe feeling the, the, the behavior um, and, and developmental um, uh, issues in terms of communication. And so these are the things that are plaguing our families um, in all of the, of the waking hours. And then when you get to the non-waking hours, um, if there is such a thing, sleep, right? We all know how important sleep is for our own well-being and certainly for, for children. And it goes without saying that sleep is a huge, huge problem um, um, for these kids and their family. And it's important to acknowledge that and talk about maybe some strategies um, um, to, to, to improve that. I'm not gonna give any take home pearls of what works because I don't have them, um, but, uh, but I think to acknowledge it um, uh, is important. 
Um, and I'm just going to skip ahead here in, in the interest of time. But um, and so sleep or the lack thereof. Um, again, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but in a survey that was done of parents, almost all reported concerns about sleep. And then when you actually did detailed sleep questionnaires, 75% scored abnormal in at least one category. And again, we won't go into the details of what these different types of, of, of sleep disturbances are, only to show you that it is extremely common. And then behavior, right? As I mentioned, uh, let's say you have someone who's even just having five seizures a week, which is still a lot of seizures, right? The majority of their waking time, they're not spent having seizures, but they still have these other behavioral issues. And I, behavior is also, I always feel such a bad term, right? I mean, because what, what is behavior? It really encompasses all of these things here. It's attention, it's mood, it's concentration, you know, it's oppositional behavior. It, it, it's all, it's all behavior. And the big question that still remains is, is why? Why did these, why do these kids have um, behavioral issues? Is it because seizures? Is it because of the medications that we have them on? Or is it something inherent in the underlying uh, SCN1A mutation? And my hand-waving answer as often is it's probably a combination of all three. Um, so let's try to focus on, on the, the two things that we can maybe change, and that would be seizures and minimizing medication exposure. And maybe, as we'll show here with some of the upcoming research studies, you know, maybe we're, we're on the doorstep of being able to do something about the SCN1A mutation. Um, but in a study that looked at behavior, this kind of shows and tries to get at, is it the epilepsy, is it the Dravé, or is it the medications? And again, it's a busy slide with bad shading, um, but essentially the, the, the dotted yellow are are um, the normal population. Um, the non dravé is, is in the second dotted yellow, and then the solid lines is the um, is dravé. And same thing for the red and the and the difference between yellow are, are the percentage of patients that actually score as borderline abnormal on some of these measures of behavior, and those in red that uh, actually um, score as clinically um, significant impairments in these. And you can see that very clearly. Um, there's something different about our Dravé patients compared to our non-Dravé epilepsy patients. And so I think this is really uh, an area that deserves a lot more attention and research as we, as we um, conduct further, um, further clinical trials. And I think it's important for us to, to let families know that this is the landscape of where things stand um, right now. And that's where we look to Ashley to help uh, us navigate um, some of these behavioral issues that we see. Um, so the lens that I hold with Dravé and behavioral issues, I was just looking at that list. Um, there's There are these obvious presentations where clearly the kid has Dravé and, and ADHD or clear autistic features. Um, but I still think that we need to learn how to parent through them. And so there's two areas that I want to acknowledge. One is that I find at the root of some of the disruptive behavior in kids and homes is a lot of these kids, a lot of our kids, they, people are inclined to give them a lot of special treatment. And I'm all for sort of total love and kindness when they're having seizures but I don't wanna rob the kids of being a normal kid who can achieve autonomy and competence um, on non-seizure days and when epilepsy is really in the background. And the kids that just get favors all the time, they end up um, just getting in charge of their families and running amok and it's really, it's not healthy for them. And so that's where I do work with a lot of families, helping parents be more in charge and learn how to say no to their kid and that it won't, it, it won't trigger a seizure. That's what parents are often afraid. Well, I just don't want to get my kid upset. Um, but it, it's a, it becomes a developmental problem. Um, the other piece I want to say about behavior is when kids are having disruptive behaviors like tantrums and freak outs, and I think it's really important that parents look underneath to find out what is going on with my kid. It's actually a clue to consider what's happening is in this family. How are mom and dad doing with this diagnosis? Is mom so tired that she's, you know, really impatient? 
So there's a whole family picture that we need to look at to assess some of the behavioral stuff that we're seeing. Okay, now I'm ready. Um, this slide is dedicated to um, families with siblings. And I just want to empower you as care providers for the families where there are siblings, um, you can bring up that once they are old enough um, and even around age two, you can start talking with them about what's going on in their home, that their sibling has epilepsy. You can begin to just put words to the story and narrate it. I, I didn't do this young enough in our home and as a result, not talking about it um, led my kids, the siblings, to have lots of um, challenges that brought us into therapy, honestly, um, because I wasn't, I wasn't remembering the impact on them. So the life support cards covers, um, I have several cards in the deck dedicated to siblings. Um, Joe just mentioned that there's clear evidence that epilepsy and sleep is an issue for our kids. And I just want you to know about this one, just a, creating a flexible sleep plan with the parents and guiding them just to know on low seizure days, what are their options? And then on, on days where seizures are more frequent, what type of arrangement do they want to set up? And in, in the early days, we actually look to you because we don't know. We just think, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to sleep away from my child or my child's never going to be able to sleep in their room. And so we really do look to you to give us your opinion about that. Like what is going to make us a thoughtful, attentive parent with this syndrome? And I think it's very family. Um, each family has to decide what is right for them. But to lay out and, and the life support cards do, there are pros and cons to the different arrangements. And I just want families to know about that. Go ahead. Um, again, we just said epilepsy and insomnia. So we had periods of years where I felt like Piper could never sleep through the night. And I just think it's important to talk with parents about what sort of backup care can they get? Do they have any extended family? What sort of respite? Um, because it really, really takes a toll on, on the whole family when people aren't sleeping. Um, and I did a talk a couple of weeks ago with a group of parents and I did remind one family, I said, you know, there's always an ebb and a flow. I promise it won't it won't stay this way forever. And she said to me, she said, that actually helps me the most is to remember um, it won't be like this forever. And I really believe that we've, we've had periods of hard sleep and then we've had periods where she can sleep through the night and there's no rhyme or reason, I don't think. Um, we also look to you to tell us what activities we can do with our kids or what, what our kids are free to do. And I want to just empower providers to help the parents think very individually about how their kid presents with what they have going on. Um, Dravet, there is such a spectrum, but if you read like a general diagnosis, it looks like our kids can't and shouldn't do a whole lot of things. And I just want to dispel that myth that we can be really creative and get them involved and engaged. Therapeutic horseback riding. I pick gymnastics because there are fluffy mats everywhere. Um, I never thought when I read the diagnosis that Piper would be able to learn to ride a bike. And she has. And it's scary. Like my nervous system is completely jacked up when I'm behind her but she does it and she's so happy and proud. So I just really encourage you to um, think creatively with your families around activities. I will say swimming, just be sure you talk to your families about the topic of swimming. I don't, I'm, I, it's a much bigger topic, but when kids become of age to learn to swim, um, parents are terrified and um, 
I encourage you to bring it up to help them navigate that important skill. Um, services for families to start thinking about, I'm just gonna run through them. Um, in the zero to three years, we, we first start with the regional center and that's just, uh, we get a referral and then we just connect with a social worker and we learn about the services our, our child qualifies for. Um, we learned about in-home respite care many years into our journey. And so I just tell families to try and go for whatever they can because you never know when that sleep problem is gonna show up. Um, I encourage families, even if their kid isn't showing remarkable delays, I'm a social worker by training and a huge advocate to give our kids, um, to focus on early intervention. So speech and language, PT and OT, getting them um, connected with Medi-Cal, even if they have private insurance, um, you can have Medi-Cal cover other bills and there are just, as we know, periods of time where our bills are through the roof. And the last one is just an interesting one for me, the getting a handicap placard. It wasn't anything I thought about for several years, but I found that it actually gave me the courage when I had three young kids to go out in the world. I was so overwhelmed and it just made things a little bit easier if I could park a little bit closer, if she were to have a seizure, I could set up something in the car, or in our case, we did keto for several years, I could have her food in the car, but it made it so that we could live and be out in the world um, and make it just a little bit easier. Um, this is just helpful as a provider to know for families that they start with um, the regional center in the zero to three years, they get their services there. And what that means is PT, OT and speech potentially are offered in the home. Of course, I don't know what we're doing with COVID at the moment, that's virtual. But those services are brought to our children in the home in the first three years. And then at age three, it's a little funky, but we go, we get connected to um, the Office of Education and the special ed department. So when the kids are about two and three quarters, I recommend that you steer them over to, to their um, county education office and they can begin to introduce themselves and begin the paperwork as well as the testing to figure out the services available to them through special ed. And there is a funky <clears throat> period between three and six or between the age of three and kindergarten because there's not a lot of state programs for our kids. So just knowing that and think creatively with your families for those, um, for those years. Um, so preparing kids for adolescence and then looking ahead, I just, I think of um, their school journey in chunks. So kindergarten to fourth or fifth grade feels like sort of a steady period of time. Um, if kids are having a lot of seizures, they may, it may make sense to repeat a year. We did kindergarten twice for Piper because she had a tough first year. Um, but I really believe in um, the public schools, their knowledge of setting up supports and services for our kids. I love blending Piper in with classmates and her siblings. Um, and then what I found out is it's really helpful to just take it year by year and to look and talk to your teacher and talk to your child. Like what, is my kid happy? Is my kid making friends? Is she getting along with the, um, the people who are providing her supports in that setting? And there's a lot of turnover in education. So go year by year as you set this up. And K through fourth or fifth grade is kind of stable. And then there's this transition to middle school, which is very different. And again, just to really think, is this a place for my child still? Or 
I, I want to encourage you to help families consider schools that might be available in their community. I'm finding schools popping up all over the place to support our kids with different abilities. And so in our case, we went and saw a few schools to learn about them, but we settled on keeping her where she is. So I just want to help parents think a little bit flexibly as well as tune into what, what is their kid showing them? How engaged are they and are they enjoying school? And I want it to be a yes. Um, and then it's a little hard for me to speak much, so I might go back to Joe about here on out because I'm, um, I'm parenting up to 12 and a half at the moment with Piper. Um, but I would say at this age, my husband and I are very clear that her intellectual disability is pretty strong and the likelihood of her living on her own is, um, is low to none. Um, and so that's something that we, we talk about as a family. But I, I do encourage providers to still bring it up and ask these hard questions because maybe one parent can talk about it and one can't. And if you bring it up, you help, um, you help bridge that gap. Uh, it helps us care for our kids better when we're facing and dealing and moving through grief and moving through denial. Yeah, and I think that's a great, um, you know, a great point in terms of, again, it's 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 getting a read on the family and what they're ready to hear. And, and when, you know, yes, I think we have to start talking about these things that may feel a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, I, I wouldn't say you start talking about, you know, um, community college when someone's 11 years old, right? You kind of, you want to understand everyone's um, trajectory. But I think once you start thinking about it, um, um, you should probably think maybe next time I'm going to talk about that, right? And not keep punting it, um, punting it down the road, because we know certainly for things like conservatorship, it can take many years. So, and so to wrap up here, um, I do think, and I think the other problem with, with having those conversations is because I think the future is starting to look a little bit brighter. And, and that may be hard for some of our families who are further along in the diagnosis to be like, oh, you know, what if? Um, but I think still holding out optimism for some of the, the, the new treatments. We now have three FDA approved medications specifically for Gervais. There are others that are in various stages of development, including some some gene therapies that could start to get at you know that whole issue of what's what's going on with behavior and sleep and certainly seizures in the setting of an SCN1 a mutation, and I can't stress the importance of of um, for providers that if you're caring for these patients and maybe you're participating in some of these clinical trials or if you're not to try and stay as up to date as you can about centers in your area that are that are um, participating in these trials because not only does that do I think it offers the opportunity to help individuals, even though in every single consent form, right, we go through that there's no guarantee that it will help you. I think um, it really has been the Gervais community that has come together and, and put trust in us um, to, to, to try and further this field that has allowed us to do, allows us to do just that. So in summary, I, I hope that, that we've shown you that signs and symptoms in Gervais syndrome certainly do evolve over time and, and it is a lot like weather, right? It's a changing landscape. There's periods of calm, there's periods of, of stability, but then there are also stresses of, of upheaval. And I think understanding and anticipating um, that um, is critical for, for me uh, as, as a provider who cares for these patients, but hopefully it's Ashley has, has shown you that it's also important um, to, for families um, um, to hear. And maybe Ashley, I'll let you bring it home. <laughs> Um, I love that there's a range of outcomes with our population. Again, when I first read about Dravet 12 years ago, I was, um, I, I really sank into some serious grief and at the age of 12 and a half, I can't believe all the things after thousands and thousands of seizures, what Piper is able to do and access even with her situation. Um, and I just, I know there's a whole spectrum. I work with families in, you know, with kids who are, are more impacted. Um, and I work with families where kids are higher, higher functioning than Piper. Um, and so just helping families really see and be with their kid and how, how they're showing, how they're presenting Dravet specifically 
as that individual child. And um, I can't say enough that the relationship you develop with your families um, has so much impact on the, the, it's like medicine, honestly, for the whole family. Um, we have had this journey with Joe and um, we've learned to not need him as much and be more of a, um, more in the seat, well, in the beginning, we needed Joe to lead. And then we got more and more comfortable and experienced to lead with him. And um, it's just a huge, huge comfort knowing that uh, we have you. And um, gosh, I, Likewise. Am, I am grateful for um, the work that all of you do to support us families. We went so, over as usual. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I'm uh, really over. It was such a fantastic talk um, with, I think, really important issues that just aren't discussed very often. And so I'd like to open up if anyone has a question for Ashley yeah. or Joe. Hello, Renika. Yeah. yeah, I just have a question. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, myself, Swick Bala from India. Uh, just I have a one request and one question to Dr. Joe Sullivan. Sure. Yeah. So uh, from I have a daughter with a CN1 mutation. And based on our experiences and observations, I strongly believe that uh, the position and type of mutation uh, in the whole spectrum of the gene uh, makes strong influence on the clinical pathology, clinical outcomes. So do we know anybody uh, who's really studying on the uh, on the type and position of the mutation versus the clinical outcome, outcomes along with the medications? So I, as far as I know, there is no group studying on such a way. If anyone is studying in that way, then we will be able to come to a certain concrete conclusion how a course of clinical pathology is going to be in a particular child. Uh, based on that, we can advise the parents and so on. So uh, uh, my suggestion is, for example, uh, uh, DSF should be able to think about it in that way if someone proposes it in that way. So uh, do you have any comment on it? Yeah, sure. So let me see if I can summarize yeah. the question. So the question is, is are there any um, specific gene mutations that may predict um, severity across the spectrum um, that sort of gives us some prognostic um, information. Um, you know, as you probably know, um, you know, there are now over a thousand different mutations that have been described um, in the SCN1 gene and uh, that yields a Dravet phenotype. Um, but even with a thousand different mutations and thousands of patients, right, the number of patients that are going to have one particular mutation and then controlling for all of the different factors, such as background genetic factors, um, how early they were diagnosed, um, what treatments um, they're on, uh, to my knowledge, there still is not a clear genotype phenotype correlation that is highly um, predictive. I do think that with more and more genetic testing as we're doing that over time and as we diagnose kids earlier, we may have better ability to understand um, the actual natural history and understand um, to what extent the specifics of the gene mutation do lead to prognostic um, differences. But, yeah. Uh, I, but, so, yeah, yeah in, in that line, uh, I would, for convenience, I would just... Uh, uh, divide the whole spectrum of gene into four quarters, four, um, four quarters. So I, I certainly uh, every quarters will have a different kind of clinical pathology and uh, certainly we'll be able to come up with a conclusion, something like that. So you please think about it in that line. Yeah. Sure. So my, yeah. Uh, my second line, uh, question is, uh, somewhere I hear that uh, the, the recent clinical trial SKT1, uh, where the dose is increased. Uh, may I know what is the reason behind it? 
So you're referring to the the SDK01 sponsored by Stoke Therapeutics. Um, so there are a number of yeah. So there are a number of different um, conversations that are going on between the sponsor and the FDA regarding how to arrive at the optimal mm -hmm. dosing mm -hmm. um, in milligrams and also the optimal dosing frequency. And so there are other trials that are uh, that are in the planning process to try and and get at that answer um, as safe and as efficiently um, as, as possible, right? Because these are first in human um, trials, which is very, very different than, than, than mm -hmm. the prior drug development where we have healthy volunteers and we know, you know, pharmacokinetics mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. And that's very different um, in, with these, these therapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you, Amber. Thank sure. you. <laughs> So, and I would love to hear Ashley weigh in on this also. I had a quick question of um, earlier in the talk, you referenced sort of that line between reading to educate yourself and sort of obsessive reading. And I think a lot of parents teeter on the balance of this, especially at the beginning of a new diagnosis. And I just wondered how, how do you help parents find that line when it's kind of too far? I just tell them the truth. <laughs> I say, I mean, I say with empathy, it's compelling and you want to read to understand. But as I found out, you know, what I read and what I was afraid of did not unfold so far in my life with Piper. And so it led me into much more anxiety and grief, but it wasn't even the course of her, her journey with Dravet or it hasn't been. Um, so it's hard enough to, to live with this diagnosis, and um, I would much rather read in small doses and really make an agreement if you're with a partner to say, let's just read the just right amount so that we don't overwhelm ourselves and we just read and learn a little bit at a time. So I'm pretty opinionated about that because I see families just living in a world of anxiety and it, 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 it's not even showing up in their kid. It's just their fear. And maybe this is a self-serving plug for the Gervais Syndrome Foundation, right? I really put them in touch with you um, because I think the material that's on the website is, is vetted by our medical advisory board and, and things, but there's also forums for families and, and, and Facebook pages and things for them to join. And again, I think that's what I caution families is, you know, not every single kid is different, right? And that's true, Dravet aside, right? And so just because one thing works for one does not mean it's gonna work for the other. Um, but at the same time, once there's sort of a, a um, sort of momentum of we hear, oh, we're, and we hear, right? We hear about Fiji water, we hear about all these things, right? Um, uh, once we start to hear more and more, as long as the risk benefit is there, I know for myself, I certainly have an open mind about that, but I think you have to go into everything with some cautious optimism. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, if no one else has any questions for Ashley and Joel, well, thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, we have one more session in this series that I hope people will join us for, and this will remain online for the next uh, year, available to watch um, for CME Accredit, and then forever it will live on the DSF website. So thank you so much for covering this really important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Happy thank Friday. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks for having us.